Alright, welcome back to Will Star Monsters and Mysteries. I have a really good one for you today. The Mountain Devils of Mount St. Helens. I've been doing a lot of research and have found some very old newspaper articles on what these creatures are from a Native American's point of view and oral history. A few different tribes from the Northwest give their oral traditions and their stories. They go into a lot of things that you might find fascinating, including how they hunt, communicate, and make themselves almost impossible to see. I've also found a few newspaper articles from the 1960s about encounters near or on Mount St. Helens, including an expert alpine skier that was chased while on his skis down the mountain. I'm going to give you the famous Ape Canyon encounter that occurred on the slopes of Mount St. Helens, where in 1924, four miners were attacked while in their cabin by these mountain devils. I have found an old newspaper article from the 1920s from a reporter that was one of the first ones to Spirit Lake after the Ape Canyon attack happened. He spoke to the forest ranger at Spirit Lake, who was one of the first people to speak to the miners after the incident. His description of the miners' reactions are very, very telling. If you like this kind of content, think about subscribing. And as always, everyone, if you like the video, smash that like button for me. You know how much YouTube loves that. And another thing, let's fill the comment section with your thoughts on what these creatures are. Do you agree with the Native Americans, or do you think there's something else? Alright, that's enough about that. Let's go ahead and get into this one. The Longview, Washington Times, August 1963. Ape Canyon Holds Unsolved Mystery. Ape Canyon, the legendary home of the hairy apes of Mount St. Helens, apparently swallowed an experienced mountaineer and expert skier in May 1950. No trace of Jim Carter, 32, who disappeared from a 20-member climbing party from Seattle was found. Although teams of the Northwest's most proficient mountain rescue units combed the area for weeks. Carter's complete disappearance is an unsolved mystery to this day, declared Bob Lee, well-known Portland mountaineer who is a member of the exclusive Worldwide Alpine Club, a leader of the 1961 Himalayan Expedition, an advisor to the 1963 American Expedition. Lee said he had never seen one of the monsters, but that there certainly was evidence that there was something strange on the high slopes of the mountain. He was convinced of this during the search for Carter, he said. Dr. Otto Trott, Lee Stark, and I finally came to the conclusion that the mountain devils got him, said Lee seriously. Lee, a member of the Seattle Mountain Search and Rescue Unit at the time, describes the hunt for Carter in Ape Canyon as the most eerie experience I have ever had. He said that every time he got cut off from the rest of the searchers during the long hunt, he got the feeling that somebody was watching me. I could feel the hair on my neck standing up. It was eerie. I was unarmed, except for my ice axe, and believe me, I never let go of that. At this point in Lee's story, I could feel my own hair standing up a bit. Ready to shoulder packs for a safari to Ape Canyon to determine whether there is any truth to the ape stories, I began to feel a little dubious about the whole expedition. The rest of Lee's tale about the Seattle man's disappearance didn't do much to reassure me. It seems that the missing man Carter had climbed Mount St. Helens with a group from Seattle on a warm, clear Sunday. On the way down the mountain, he left the other climbers near a landmark called Dog's Head at the 8,000-foot level. Carter told them he would ski around to the left and take a picture of the group as they skied down to the timberline. That was the last time that anyone saw Carter. The next morning, searchers found a discarded film box at the point where he had taken a picture. From here, Carter evidently took off down the mountain in a wild, death-defying dash, taking chances that no skier of his caliber would ever take, unless something was terribly wrong or he was being pursued, says Lee, who was one of the first searchers to reach Carter's ski tracks. He jumped over two or three large crevasses and apparently was going like the devil. When Carter's tracks reached the precipitous sides of Ape Canyon, the searchers were amazed to see that Carter had been in such a hurry that he went right down the steep canyon walls, but they did not find him at the bottom of the canyon as they expected. We combed the canyon, one end to the other, for five days. Sometimes there were as many as five people in a search party, but no sign of Carter or of his equipment was ever found, Lee says. After two weeks, the search was called off. Lee, who has lived in the Northwest most of his life, recalls there are about 25 different reports of people attacked by ape-like men in the St. Helens and Cascade areas over a 20-year period. One was the group of Boy Scouts from Centralia, he said. As near as he could remember, several of the boys who were taken off the mountain were hysterical after being attacked by the mountain devils. 
Director Dick Whitney of the Regional Boy Scout Office in Olympia, Washington, promised to look for a record of the incident. To our surprise, he called back to say that he had located the name of the leader and the troop involved in the incident. It was a troop under the late Scoutmaster Pease from Centralia, he said. Whitney promised to have Pease's son, who works for the state of Washington, call the journal as soon as he returns from vacation. Miners, scouts, Indians, mountaineers, and most recently, an editor and other reliable Portland residents. The list of persons who have seen the hairy apes of Mount St. Helens is very impressive. The Oregon Journal, 1962. Are the legendary hairy giants of Mount St. Helens, which reportedly terrorized early visitors to that area on the march again. Strange, unidentified monsters reportedly sighted by two different groups of Portland visitors to the Washington area during the past weekend brought knowing nods from old-timers. These things have been seen before. Three persons driving along a remote mountain road east of the Cascade Wilderness area early Sunday said they saw a 10-foot white hairy figure moving rapidly along the roadside. It was caught in the headlights as their car passed but they were too frightened to turn around to investigate. Another Portland woman and her husband fishing on the Lewis River south of Mount St. Helens saw a huge beige figure bigger than any human along the bank of the river as they watched it and moved into the thicket with a lumbering gait. These reports are shades of the famous Mount St. Helens apes, according to retired forest ranger Marshall Sternison, who was stationed at the ranger station for many years. He has listened to and investigated many reports about the strange monsters that supposedly inhabit the slopes and the remote wild country around the beautiful mountain. Sternison is now stationed in Portland, but while he was in charge of the mountain ranger station, he instigated an an investigation into the history and legends of the St. Helens area. This investigation revealed that the stories of the hairy giants on Mount St. Helens are older than the white man's inhabitation of the northwest. The Clallam Indian tribe claims these giants are the ferocious Selatic Indians, a tribe of renegade marauder-like people who live like animals in the caves and lava tunnels in the high cascades. Evidently, one of the first white man's encounters with these creatures was a wild one. In 1924, Marion Smith and five miners rushed into Kelso, Washington to report that a band of great ape-like creatures had attacked them in the middle of the night. Smith said they had been working in a mine on the east side of Mount St. Helens. They encountered some of the hairy giants on the mountainside during the daytime and fired on them to halt an attack at that time. One of the huge creatures was believed slain, and the body rolled over a cliff into a deep ravine, destined thereafter to be known as Ape Canyon, located on the southeastern slope of Mount St. Helens. The attack continued after dark. Smith reported to the Collitz County Sheriff, the hairy giant ape men pelted their cabin all night with rocks and danced and screamed until daylight. They described the mountain devils as being at least seven foot tall and covered with long black hair. Their arms were long and trailed, they said. The great ape hunt of 1924 followed, but no apes were ever found. Reference to apes is the white man's term. The local Indians say that they are renegade outcasts, a type of people. The sheriff led a large party out of Kelso on an eerie trip to Mount St. Helens with all participants armed. They found huge footprints around the miners' cabin, but never saw what made the footprints. Nevertheless, the miners never went back to mining in the area. Inspired by this white man's legend, an employee at the ranger station later had a lot of fun with a large foot form. From time to time, he left its imprints on the lake shore around Spirit Lake. This caused a lot of excitement, and later, when someone discovered all the tracks were of the same right foot, he admitted the hoax. However, the hairy giant legend persists today, and more fuel has been added to the fire from time to time as intermittent reports have come in about persons sighting strange figures on the mountainsides or hearing weird noises in the wilderness. All right, so now I have Fred Beck's own words about the encounter that happened at Ape Canyon in 1924. If you guys don't know, he was one of the miners in the cabin. First of all, I wish to give an account of the attack and tell of the famous incident of July 1924, when the hairy apes attacked our cabin. We had been prospecting for six years in the Mount St. Helens and Lewis River area in southwest Washington. We had, from time to time, come across large tracks by creek beds and springs. 
1924, I and four other miners were working our gold claim, the Vander White. It was two miles east of Mount St. Helens near a deep canyon, now named Ape Canyon, which was so named after an account of the incident reached the newspapers. Hank, a great hunter and good woodsman, was always a little apprehensive after seeing the tracks. The tracks were large, and we knew that no other animal could have made them. The largest measured 19 inches. It was in the middle of July, and we had received a good assay on our claim, and everybody was excited. I remember I had a tooth that was aching, and I suggested to Hank that he should take me to town to see a dentist. But he was so enthused in the prospect of the gold mine, he barely took time to answer me. He replied that God or the devil could not get him away from there. We had all come up in his Ford, and I had no way to get back to town unless he took me. So, when we went back to the cabin, on the north side of the canyon, <clears throat> I had a nagging toothache and little appetite for our evening meal of beans and hotcakes. Hank, though apprehensive, was still determined. We had been hearing noises in the evening for about a week. We heard a shrill, particular whistle each evening. We would hear it coming from one ridge and then hear an answering whistling from another ridge. We also heard a sound which I could best describe as a booming, thumping sound, just like something was hitting itself on its chest. Hank asked me to accompany him to the spring about 100 yards from our cabin to get some water and suggested we take our rifles to be on the safe side. We walked to the spring, and then Hank yelled and raised his rifle, and at that instant, I saw it. It was a hairy creature, and he was about 100 yards away on the other side of a little canyon standing by a pine tree. It dodged behind the tree and poked its head out from the side of the tree. And at the same time, Hank shot. I could see the bark fly out from the tree from each of his three shots. Someone may say that that was quite a distance to see bark fly, but I saw it. The creature I judged to have been about seven feet tall with blackish brown hair. It disappeared from our view for a short time, but then we saw it running fast and upright about 200 yards down the little canyon. I shot three times before it disappeared from view. We took the water back to the cabin and explained the affair to the rest of the party, and we all agreed, including Hank, to go home the next morning, as it would be dark before we could get to the car. We agreed it would be unsound to be caught by darkness on the way out. Nightfall found us in our pine log cabin. We had built the cabin ourselves. We had made it very sturdy. It stood for years afterward and was visited by many sightseers until a few years ago when it was burned to the ground. The circumstances of the fire I do not recall. In the cabin, we had a long bunk bed in which two could sleep feet to feet, the rest of us sleeping on pine boughs on the floor. At one end of the cabin, we had a fireplace fashioned out of rocks. There were no windows in the cabin, so darkness found us all in the cabin more calm now and my tooth was better. Somehow the excitement seemed to work a temporary cure on it. We were sitting around puffing on pipes and talking about the trip home the next day. Each of us settled down in his crude but welcome bed and then soon fell asleep. About midnight, we were all awakened. Hank, who was sleeping on the floor, was yelling and kicking, but the noise that had awakened us was a tremendous thud against the cabin wall. Some of the chinking had been knocked loose from between the logs and it fell across Hank's chest. He had his rifle in his hand and was waving it back and forth as he kicked and yelled. Hank always slept with his gun nearby. It was a Remington automatic, my gun being a 3030 Winchester, which I still have. I helped to get the chinking off of him and he jumped to his feet. Then we heard a great commotion outside. It sounded like a great number of feet trampling and rattling over a pile of our unused shakes. We grabbed our guns, Hank squinting through the space left by the chinking. By actual account, we saw only three of the creatures together at one time, but it sounded like there were many more. This was the first of the famous attack, of which so much has been written in Washington and Oregon papers throughout the years. Most accounts tell of giant boulders being hurled against the cabin and say some even fell through the roof, but this was not quite the case. There were very few large rocks around in that area. It is true that many smaller ones were hurled at the cabin, but they did not break through the roof, but hit with a bang and rolled off. Some did fall through the chimney of the fireplace. Some accounts state I was hit in the head by a rock and knocked unconscious. This is not true. The only time we shot our guns that night was when the creatures were attacking our cabin. When they would quiet down for a few minutes, we would quit shooting. I told the rest of the party that maybe if they saw we were only shooting when they attacked, they might realize we were only defending ourselves. We could have had clear shots at them through the opening left by the chinking if we had chosen to. We did shoot, however, when they climbed up on our roof. We shot round after round through the roof. We had to brace the hewed log door with a long pole taken from the bunk bed. 
The creatures were pushing against it, and the whole door vibrated from the impact. We responded by firing many more rounds through the door. They pushed against the walls of the cabin as if trying to push the cabin over, but this was pretty much an impossibility. As previously stated, the cabin was a sturdy main building. Hank and I did most of the shooting. The rest of the party crowded to the far end of the cabin, guns in their hands. One had a pistol, which is still in my family's possession. The others clutched the rifles. They seemed stunned and incredulous. The attack continued the remainder of the night, with only short intervals in between. A most profound and frightening experience occurred when one of the creatures being close to the cabin reached an arm through the chinking space and seized one of our axes by the handle. Before the thing could pull the axe out, I swiftly turned the head of the axe upright so that it caught on the log. And at the same time, Hank shot, barely missing my hand. The creature let go and I pulled the handle back in and put the axe in a safe place. A humorous thing that I will remember is Hank singing. If you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone and we'll all go home in the morning. He did not mean it to be humorous, for Hank was dead serious and sang under the impression that the mountain devils, as he called them, might understand and go away. The attack ended just before daylight. Just as soon as we were sure it was light enough to see, we came cautiously out of the cabin. It was not long before I saw one of the ape-like creatures standing about 80 yards away near the edge of Ape Canyon. I shot three times and it toppled over the cliff down into the gorge some 400 feet below. Then Hank said that we should get out of there as soon as possible and not bother to pack our supplies or equipment out. After all, he said, it's better to lose them than lose our lives. We were all only too glad to agree. We brought out only which we could get in our pack sacks. We left about $200 in supplies, powder, and drilling equipment behind. I tried to persuade everyone not to relate the beginnings to anyone, and they agreed. But Hank soon let the cat out of the bag. We made our way to Spira Lake and Hank went into the ranger station. He had told the ranger earlier about the tracks and the ranger had replied, let me know if you find out what they are. That was just what Hank did to the puzzlement of the ranger. All right, so here is the ranger's side of the story when the miners come in after their encounter. It's really interesting, especially how you can infer from their reaction that he noticed that something really did happen to these guys or their behavior wouldn't have been like that, I don't think. So that's just my opinion. Let's get to it. The morning in 1924 at the Spirit Lake Ranger Station was beautiful, like a morning in this high country, Bill Welch, 68, recalled. What made this morning so different was the man coming from the direction of the ranger station with a rifle in his hand. Welch could see the visitor was pretty wild-eyed, and he recognized him as a man who had a cabin with several others about five or six miles from the station at the head of what was called Muddy Creek. Well, I got him, the man said as he slowed down in front of the forest guard Welch. Got who or what? The mountain devil. You mean a cougar? No, the mountain devil. You mean a wolverine? No, the mountain devil. Welch, standing outside the barn, eyeing the newcomer warily, recalled him as a man who had been at the station two or three weeks earlier. Permits were needed to build a fire outside the campgrounds of Spirit Lake, and this man in his 50s had stopped in and asked permission to build a fire in his cabin. Permits were not needed for this. In the course of the earlier conversation, the man told Welch that he and several others had a mine near the cabin. He also volunteered the information that mountain devils had been trailing and bothering the men in the last several years. He hadn't seen these devils, but had viewed some of their tracks. Welch had thought this was a little far-fetched. He didn't think that there were any wolves or wolverines in the area. It's the first I've heard of it, he said. If you run into any of those mountain devils, let me know. I will, the mountain miner said. Now, standing facing the gun-carrying mountain man, Welch began wondering if he could get close enough to grab the rifle and started worrying about his wife at the ranger station. Had this definitely disturbed newcomer murdered her? As the talk continued, Welch was relieved to see his wife come out the door of the ranger station. The visitor was insisting that he had shot the mountain devil and that it had slid over a bluff at the cabin. He also said that his partners were in the car near the ranger station after coming down from the cabin with him. Welch still thought the man had blown his top, and when he went over to the touring car, which carried three men in front and two in the back, he found the others were just as wild as he was, sitting there clutching their guns. The man who had walked over to see Welch vowed that they were going back home and would never come back here again. The five left shortly afterward headed for Kelso. 
Welsh didn't know at the time, but he was getting involved in a key incident of the legend of Mount St. Helens, Harry Apes. The ape label quickly took predominance over the mountain devils, and the alleged existence of the creature has been a subject of recurrent speculation over the years. Welch talked to his wife, who had been the first person to encounter the departing miners after they left the cabin, and she told him about the man coming to the door with rifle across his shoulder, an incident she still remembers vividly to date. The miner's eyes were glazed from some evidently shocking experience as he informed Mrs. Welch, We got him! We got him! Well, what? The mountain devil! There was a pause, and the miner explained. Well, we know your husband told us to let him know if we ever saw any, so I stopped to tell him we saw one and killed it. But we are going out and never coming back. Miss Welch hardly knew what he was talking about, but told the gun toter that her husband was out at the barn, and he walked towards the barn to meet Welch. After the carload of men had left, Welch called Jim Huffman, the district manager at Amboy, and told him what had happened. He still wondered if the miners might have encountered a wolverine, this is a vicious little animal that can wreck cabins and destroys what it doesn't eat. There were rumors of wolverines on Mount St. Helens about this time, but no one, as so far as the forest guard knew, had seen one. More details were soon forthcoming from the miners, who were interviewed by a reporter after they had reached Kelso on July 12, 1924. Fight with the Big Apes, reported by miners, was one headline on the reporter's account, which he termed the strangest story to come from the Cascade Mountains. The returning miners had encountered the fabled mountain devils, or mountain gorillas of Mount St. Helens, according to the reporter, who also stated the men had been prospecting a claim on the Muddy, a branch of the Lewis River about eight miles from Spirit Lake. They saw four of the huge animals, which are about seven feet tall, weigh about 400 pounds, and walk erect. Smith and his companions have seen the tracks of the animals several times in the last six years and the Indians have told of mountain devils for 60 years, but none of the animals ever has been seen before. Smith met up with one of the animals and fired at it with a revolver. Thursday, Fred Beck shot one, the body falling over a precipice. That night, the animals bombarded the cabin where the men were, with large showers of rocks, many of them large ones, knocking chunks out of the log cabin. Many of the rocks fell through a hole, and two of the rocks struck Beck, one of them rendering him unconscious for nearly two hours. The animals have the appearance of huge gorillas. They are covered with long black hair. Their ears are about four inches long and stick straight up. They have four toes, short and stubby. The tracks are 13 to 14 inches long. These tracks have been seen by forest rangers and prospectors for years. The prospectors built a new cabin this year and it is believed it is close to a cave occupied by the animals. Mr. Smith believes he knows the location of the cave. On the evening that the news was sent by wire from Kelso, Welch recalled, Frank Lynch, a Seattle newspaper man, and Bert Hammerstrom, a freelance writer and brother-in-law of Clarence Darrow, arrived by car at the Spirit Lake Ranger Station. They had quite a trip in reaching the place, as nine hours were required for a drive from Castle Rock to Spirit Lake in 1924, Welch remembered. He said the road was not too good, and in some places a driver had to try three or four roads before finding the right one. A side road might meander off into nothing. Welch later recalled the date as July 14th. When the news had been received in Seattle and when he reached the ranger station, he and his friends were ready with a lot of questions about the apes, who reportedly had rained rocks as large as a man's head on the miner's cabin. And as Welch told the story, had tried to pry the cabin into the Smith Creek abyss. All right, so now we're going to get into the Native American origins of the Sasquatch and what they believe these creatures to be how they live, how they hunt, all those things from a Native American perspective, which to me carries way more weight. They've been around the creatures way longer than we have. So I have a newspaper article from 1924 that interviews a bunch of Native American tribal elders and a few other articles also. So this is going to be really interesting. Let's get into it. Mountain devils discovered at Mount St. Helens near Kelso are none other than the Seatic tribe, says George Totsky, Klalem tribal leader. Siatik is a Klalem pronunciation. All of the tribes pronounce it Siatko. The Indians of the Northwest have kept the existence of Siatiks a secret, partly because they know no white man would believe them, and the Indian, known for his honesty and truthfulness, does not like to be called a liar, and partly because the Northwest Indians are ashamed of the Siatik tribe. 
The Mountain Devils, or guerrillas, who bombarded the Prospector Shack on Mount St. Helens in 1924, according to the description of the miners, are none other than the Seatic tribe, with whom every Indian in the Northwest is familiar, said Totsky. The Seatics were last heard of by the Clallam Indians about 1900, and it was believed by the present-day Indians that they had become extinct. The Seatic tribe also make their home in caves in the heart of the wilderness on Vancouver Island and in the Olympic Range, in particular Mount St. Helens. As described by the Clallam Indians, the Seatics are 7 to 8 feet tall. They have hairy bodies like the bear. They are great hypnotists and kill their game by stunning them with hypnotic power. They also have the gift of ventriloquism, throwing their voices at great distances, and can imitate any bird in the Northwest. They have a very keen sense of humor, Totsky added. In the past generations, they stole many Indian women and Indian babies. They lived entirely in the mountain, coming down to the shores only when they wanted a change of diet. The Quinaults claim they generally come once a year to the Quinault River about fall. The Clallams say they favor the river area near Brennan on Mount Hood. After having their fill of fresh salmon, they stole dry salmon from the Indian women. The Seatic tribe are harmless if left alone. The Clallam tribe, however, at one time several generations ago, killed a young man of the Seatic tribe to their everlasting sorrow for they killed off a whole branch of the Clallam tribe but one, and he was merely left to tell the tale to the other Clallams up sound. The Clallam Indians believed that the Seatic tribe had become extinct. It is 15 years since their tracks were last seen and recognized on the Brennan River. Prior to that time, many Clallam Indians have met and talked with men of the strange tribe. For the Seatics talk the strange tongue of the Clallams, which is said to have originated from the bear tongue. The Quinault Indians, however, claim that Fred Pope of the Quinault tribe and George Hyasman of the Satsop tribe were fishing about 15 miles up the Quinault River in the month of September four years ago, 1920, when they were visited by the Seatics. The two Indians had caught a lot of steelhead trout, which they left in their canoe and the Seatics stole these. Henry Napoleon of the Clallam tribe is the only Indian who was ever invited to the home of the Seatic tribe. It was while Napoleon was visiting relatives on the British Columbia coast about 30 years ago, that would have made the year roughly 1895, that he met a Seatic while hunting. The giant Indian then invited him to their home, which is in the very heart of the wilderness on Vancouver Island. Napoleon claims that they live in a large cave. He was treated with every courtesy and told of some of their secrets. He claims that the giant Indians made themselves invisible by strange medicine that they rub all over their bodies and that they were able to cause great fear by hypnotic power and had the gift of ventriloquism to mimic the owl and throw their voices. Some Indians claim that during the process of evolution, when the Indian was changing from animal to man, the Seatic did not fully observe the soul power and thus he became an anomaly in the process of evolution. The Indians of the Northwest are of the belief that the mountain devils found at Mount St. Helens are indeed the Seatic Indians, and it is generally their custom to frighten persons who have displeased them by throwing rocks at them. Okay, here's another article from 1924. Every Indian, especially of the Puget Sound tribes, is familiar with the history of these strange giant Indians, as they are sometimes referred by local Indians. Shaker Indians of northwestern Oregon related to the writer their experience with the Seatic Indians. Oregon and Washington Indians agree that Seatic Indians are not less than 7 feet tall and some have been seen that were fully 8 feet tall. They have hairy bodies like a bear. This is to protect them from the cold as they live entirely in the mountains. They kill their game entirely by hypnotism. They have great supernatural powers. They also have the gift of ventriloquism and have deceived many ordinary Indians by throwing their voices. These Indians talk beside the bear language of the Clallam tribe and the bird language. The writer was told by Oregon Indians during his research work, among them last year, that the Seatic tribe can imitate any bird of the Northwest, especially the blue jay, and that they have a very keen sense of smell. Oregon Indians at times have been greatly humiliated by the Seatics' vulgar sense of humor. The Seatics play practical jokes upon them and steal their Indian women. Sometimes an Indian woman comes back. More often, she does not. And it is even said by some Northwestern Indians, they have a strain of the Seatic blood in them. 
Oregon and Washington Indians differ in regard to the Sea of Ticks home. Oregon Indians assert they made their home in or near Mount Rainier, while the Puget Sound Indians say they live in the heart of the wilderness at Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Henry Napoleon of the Clallam tribe came upon one of the members of the Seatek tribe while out hunting on Vancouver Island. He related the story to the writer. I had been visiting relatives near Duncan, British Columbia, and while there I had been told many stories of the Seatiks by the Cowichan tribe of British Columbia, and warned by them not to go too far into the wilderness. However, in following a buck I had wounded, I went further in than I expected. It was at twilight when I came across an animal that I believed to be a big bear. But as I aimed at him with my gun, he looked and spoke to me in my own tongue. He was about seven feet tall and his body very hairy. As he invited me to sit down, he told me that I came upon him unaware and that his mind had been projected to distant relatives of his. Otherwise, he would never have been seen. After we talked for some time, he invited me to the sea ticks home. Though it was now dark, yet the giant Indian followed the trail very easily. Then we began an underground trail, and after hours of travel, we came to a large cave, which he said was the home of his people, and that they lived during the winter in different caves on Vancouver Island. He told me that the reason they were not seen very much was because they had a strange medicine that they rubbed all over their bodies, so it made them invisible, and that combined with their hypnotic powers made them very strong Tamanawis men. They also told me that they could talk almost any Indian language in the Northwest. The next day they led me out, and just at twilight, I came out of the underground trail, and they accompanied me to within a mile of the Indian village I was staying at. The Seatic tribe is harmless if left alone. However, if one of their members is injured or killed, they generally take 12 lives for one. This the Indians of the Northwest have learned. And even though the Seatic tribe steal all their dried meat or salmon, or even steal their women, the Puget Sound Indians will not try to retaliate. For once the Clallam tribe in righteous indignation captured a young man of the Seatic tribe at Seabeck, Washington, and took him across the Hood Canal to Brennan, where the other Clallam Indians were camped. Quenchton, the writer's own grandfather kept telling the Clallams to be careful of the Seatic's supernatural powers, but he was only laughed at. It was later told by Quiachan that while they were 20 yards from the shore, the young Seatic made a mighty leap and immediately made for the mountains. Quiachan warned his people that they should move, but again he was laughed at. That very night, the Seatic tribe came down and killed every Clallam there but Quiachan, who had moved his family across the canal. Coastal tribes call them Silatiks, sometimes spelled Siatik. They describe beings that roam the Cascade Mountain Range, sleeping by day and hunting by night. The giant hairy creatures were known to carry off horses and people. Indian lore describes them as members of the fierce Silatik tribe, a band of renegades who look like giant apes and live like wild animals in secluded caves high in the Cascade Mountain Range. Children were taught never to say their name. Because if the beast heard their names, they would come and capture a human from the tribe. Elkana Walker, a missionary to the Spokane tribe, described local belief in a letter written to the missionary board in April 1840. Walker reported that local tribes believed in a race of giants that inhabited a mountain west of their lands. The giants lived near the top of the mountain, which was covered with perpetual snow. Since they could not see in daylight, they hunted and worked at night. The men were thieves who came to people's lodges and kidnapped them as they slept. Victims were placed under skins and taken to the creature's homes without even being awakened. When humans did awaken, they were lost and distorted and had no sense of direction, their way home totally unknown. This being left tracks a foot and a half in length, possessing a great strength. This beast has been known to carry two or three logs at one time across their backs. Often they stole salmon from fishing nets during the night and devoured the fish raw. People who were awake when the giants came knew they were nearby by the overwhelming strong stench they gave off. It was not uncommon for the creatures to come at night, give three whistles, and then throw stones at the humans' lodges. Elders of the Colville tribe tell of an Indian man who was kidnapped by the great hairy beast. After living with them in their cedar bark shelters for one year, he was returned to the spot from which he had been taken. A hunting party found their tribesmen at the exact site he had last been seen, in a trance-like state. 
When he recovered from the hypnotic spell, he told of living with a giant beast who were great hunters and were able to scamper up impossibly steep cliffs and shoulder heavy loads of game. They hunted by night, leaving their crude bark shelters and returning at daybreak with their prey. The mammoth beings used signals to communicate, sometimes sounding like hooting owls, and they possessed the power to hypnotize their captives. Tribal elder Isabel Arcasa once said during an interview, the reports of the big footprints are nothing new. We Indian people knew all about these dark people even if we have never seen them. Indians would never go anywhere near places where the Celotics were known to inhabit. If tribal members ever encountered the Celotics, they were careful not to offend them, believing that if a man were to harm one of the creatures, they would never forget the incident. They also said that if you ever saw a Celotic to show that you were friendly, the way to express this was to wave cedar boughs at the Celotic, so that it would then know that you had come in peace.